In today's video, we're going to walk through using ORM Lite's built-in database migration functionality and how it can be used for local CI and testing workflows to give you a type-safe, repeatable and testable database migration. Updating your local testing and production relational database schema based on changing requirements is a process that can be hard to test and automate to be consistent. ORM Lite keeps its minimal abstraction approach when it comes to database migration tooling using a changed based migration solution that facilitates code first development and promotes repeatability and testing when it comes to automating your migrations. Migrations are written in c -sharp, so this code-first approach treats database migrations like any other maintainable and logically structured code written by developers where it maintains a connected audit history and source control together with the feature that needs the schema updated. Migrations are declared in c -sharp in your Appos project and named to create a simple order of steps. No additional configuration is needed as the migration app task uses your Appos configuration to connect to the same database as your application does. Changes are then applied in this deterministic way so you can always recreate your database from the first migration to the last by running your application and specifying an app tasks migrate argument or from built-in.NET tests. Migration classes have two main methods that are designed to be overridden as required called up and down. Up is where your migration code lives, and down is for rollbacks where applicable. And since ORM Lite uses class models to represent tables, we can use the migrate method to specify a type which can be used in a declarative way with attributes to apply changes. This declarative approach uses inner classes of the same name to represent those changes, so you only need to include the properties related to that specific migration when declaring these inner classes. Each time you're working on a feature that requires a migration, a new migration class with an incrementing number suffix should be created and declared just what's involved in that specific feature migration. And as these classes build up over time, you get a complete history of your database migrations as well as a repeatable process that can be heavily used in local and continuous integration testing. This approach also has the bonus that when new developers join the team, the process of initializing the database for development is already well defined and tested to get that application running quickly. To illustrate this developer workflow from local testing and an automated CI process, let's create a new project and walk through making changes to our schema to facilitate requirements of our application. To do this, we will be using the Blazor Tailwind template which uses SQLite for the bookings example. We will set up our application locally, make schema changes, and then test them in both a local environment and deploy changes as we go using GitHub Actions as well. To start things off, we are going to create a project using the servicestack.net website. By navigating to servicestack.net and clicking on Get Started in the top right, we will be greeted with our project template generator. At the top, we have a choice of different types of templates, including Jamstack templates. Clicking on Jamstacks will take us to jamstacks.net where we can provide a name and select the Blazor Tailwind template, which is already set up with SQLite and a sample bookings application. Once downloaded, extract the zip file to a local working directory and open the solution with your favorite .NET IDE. In our IDE, we will see the four standard service stack projects common in our templates, as well as a client project which contains our Blazor WASM front end. Opening the app host project, we will have multiple configure CS files, including a configure.db.migrations file with a migrations folder as well. The configure.db.migrations file is where our migration tasks are registered so we can run these tasks with the same context as our app host. That is, you don't need to configure additional connection strings or settings since our same app host runs your applications as well as our migration tasks. These app tasks are named delegates that we can specify straight from a .NET run command, and for the migrate task, we can use the built-in tests to run these tasks straight from your IDE. In our developer workflow, we will use the built-in tests to iterate on features that require changing our schema. So for a new developer or setting up a project from scratch, we will use the IDE test explorer to run these tasks explicitly. 
These tasks are ignored for a standard run of .NET test by using the explicit attribute, so it won't interfere with your normal testing workflow during development. By default, the Blazor Tailwind template is set up with a migration step to create our initial bookings table and seed it with three bookings. Your first migration will be a snapshot of your initial database model classes when you first deploy to a production environment, just like we have here with this internal booking class. Running the migrate task will look for classes that derive from the migration base class in your app host assembly and run them in ascending order. When we are ready to create another migration step, we leave this Migration1000 class in our codebase and create a new class called Migration1001 that inherits from Migration Base. This increment of the number suffix ensures a simple ascending order can be applied, so when subsequent migrations are run, we have a deterministic order of operations that can create our application database from the beginning and apply our changes in the correct order. When our migration process is run, it stores data as each migration step is completed in the migration table in your database, so the process knows which steps to skip and which steps still need to be run in our ordered migrations. In the migrations table itself, we can see the row for the migration 1000 step. We can see the connection string used, start and complete date, a log of commands and any related errors if something went wrong. Now that our booking table has been created with the Migration 1000 step, let's add support for tracking if bookings are from a repeat guest. This feature will require an additional column in our schema, so let's walk through the steps we will follow in our developer workflow. Like normal, we will first add the new property to our application booking model to support the storage and access of this additional data. Next, we will want to add support for this additional data in our APIs. And since our bookings are accessed from auto query CRUD services, we will add the same property to the create and update booking request DTO classes. If we run our application as is now, when we try to access the bookings class via our APIs, we will get a runtime error since our database queries will be trying to specify a column that doesn't yet exist. This is where we will create a new migration to support the feature in our database schema. We will create a new migration 1001 class that inherits from migration base and overrides the up and down method. Next, we will declare an inner class called booking to match the table we'll be working on and declare a single isRepeatGuest property. This represents the new column we want to add in our booking table. To process this declarative migration, we call the migrateBooking function in our overridden up method and the revertBooking method in our overridden down method. Note that the migration function is taking the inner class as the generic type, not the shared booking model that you are using in your application. To apply this migration, we run the migrate migration task from our test explorer. In the output, we can see the SQL that's been run, and our local database schema has been updated to support our new feature. This provides a fast way to change your database and test your migration at the same time during your development workflow. And if we are building a new feature that requires a new table or tables, we can safely rerun our migration while designing the new schema, creating quick turnaround times for testing. Working on features for existing tables can be daunting when you are less sure about how the migration process will impact your production database, so this same dev workflow enables fast testing to provide that extra confidence when building those features. For example, let's say that while working on this feature, we've decided that the column name should be shortened to just repeat guest dropping the is prefix. We can use the revert last migration task to run the revert step, which in this case will drop our new column. Then we would refactor our application with the new name and finally update our migration process and run it again. The order of the steps is important since our database is stateful and the revert process needs to complete successfully to reapply the migration. For example, if we rename the property in the inner booking class from isRepeatGuest to RepeatGuest before running the revert, our revert last migration step will fail because it's trying to remove a column that doesn't exist in our database schema. 
We can see this clearly in the test output and if needed step through and debug our migration process to troubleshoot. A big advantage of having this repeatable process in C Sharp is that all your debug tooling you use for your application is now the same for your migration process. If this column change wasn't picked up until after the migration process into your production application was finished, we will then create a new migration to apply the rename. We can still do this in a declarative way using attributes as well. Walking through the process again, we create a new migration 1002 class, inherit from migration base, override the up and down methods, create the inner booking class with the property of the rename column, but this time using a rename column attribute specifying the old name. Some migrations might require a more complex set of steps where you want to control the order of changes applied. So instead of using the migrate and revert generic methods, we can use extension methods off the DB instance for specific changes like add, rename and drop column. If you need more control still, you can fall back to DB execute SQL since your migration class and the up and down methods can be used however you need to complete your migrations. So while you might use declarative migrations in one migration, you can use a different approach in another. Here we have an example of a larger change to add multiple tables to support a web game backend. We have a level, player, profile and game item tables that we need to seed values and create relationships for. We can use the code first attributes that are used for ORM Lite to create foreign keys, indexes and constraints. In the up method of our migration, we create the tables using db.createTable in the correct order based on table dependencies and then seed the initial data we need. And then in the down method, we do the reverse of clearing the data and dropping the tables in the reverse order. So far, we have looked at everything running locally, but this template also comes with GitHub Actions built in to push these migrations as a part of a deployment process using SSH and Docker Compose. We have a detailed video and documentation on this built-in deployment process if you want a step-by-step -step walkthrough on how to set this up. But as an overview, we have a Linux server accessible via SSH running Docker and Docker Compose, DNS configured to point to our Linux host, and Nginx proxy with a Let's Encrypt companion running via Docker to forward requests for specific hosts to their associated containers. With this server configured, we then only need to add our project to GitHub and set up a few GitHub action secrets to have a working deployment via SSH. Our template already includes a GitHub action step in the deployment job that uses the same Docker image of our application to process the latest migrations. Just by running our application with the app task command line option, our migration starts up our app host with all the configuration of your normal application startup, but runs the migration task and exits when finished. Here we have our application running SQLite and it's being deployed using SSH and Docker Compose. The migration step is declared in our Docker Compose template, but is only run when specified, which can be seen here in the migration step in our GitHub Action workflow. This means we can see the full output of our migration step in our GitHub Actions workflow to see the SQL used during the migration. If a migration fails, the down method of our migration will fire, the process will have an error exit code, and the CI will fail the step, stopping your deployment. If you're using a different setup for deployments, you can use this migration process by running the new version of your application in the same environment you're deploying to, but specifying the app tasks equals migrate flag and only proceeding to replace your existing version if the migration exits with a zero exit code. And since the DB migrations are ARM Lite based and configuration comes from your app host, the code for migrations is the same regardless of if you're targeting SQL Lite, SQL Server, Postgres, or MySQL. ORM Lite DB migrations provides a lot of advantages, largely thanks to its repeatability that fits into your existing workflows, reduces risk, and helps us as developers have confidence when changing our database schemas. Well, that's it for this video. If you have any suggestions or feedback about our templates or videos, let us know in the comments. If you want to know more, check out our other videos and join us in the ServiceStack community through our Discord and GitHub discussions.
Service Stack is free for individuals and open source projects, so anyone is welcome. And as always, thanks for watching.